All right, I'm joined today by my colleague, Coach Caitlin Tossi. All right, Coach, we got you here in the locker room. We're going to talk all about uh, marathon goal setting. And I know listeners out there, viewers out there, if you're watching us on YouTube, you're thinking to yourself, why are we talking about goals right now? My, my marathon isn't for another couple of months. Like, whoa, slow the horses here. You're giving me anxiety. Chill out, Michael. Why are we going to talk? We're talking about this today because, Caitlin, I think goals are a big part of the marathon process, the build process, the the, the training block process. I know I think about my goals throughout my however many weeks of training. It's something that occupies my thoughts uh, during my easy runs, my long runs. And it's something that I'm sort of like, I'm like always kind of adju- adjusting in my head, what my goals are going to be and what my plan is. And what's this future in marathoning? Why do I do this? Um, <laughs> I think, I think to be any even more intense, I think I have a lot of goals going in like to the first very weeks of training. So don't worry, you're not as intense, I think, as I am. I've got the goals thought out even as I'm, you know, prepping for base training. Yeah. So, and we'll break that all down. So we've got an, a nice yeah. tidy table of contents here that we're working off our show notes. They're exquisite. Uh, we'll have to just like, <laughs> maybe I'll just like copy and paste it into the transcript. It's so good. Um, so we'll stick oh, to the okay. plan here today and we're going to walk through our approach, uh, both as experienced marathon runners, experienced distance runners. Uh, we've been in the game for mm-hmm. a long time. Uh, and, also, Caitlin, obviously, you're a, you're a certified coach. You're somebody who coaches a lot of athletes, a lot of marathon runners uh, of mm-hmm. various stripes in order to achieve their goals. So we're going to go through your your learnings, one of these words I love, your learnings that you've uh, accrued <laughs> okay. as a coach with your training over the years and your experience coaching athletes of all ability levels. Awesome. Okay, so let's get right into it. First things first. Let's go. Let's, let's do this. You, we're starting with an acronym. <laughs> Uh, let's, oh, let's yes. get technical understanding smart goals. Now this is capital S capital M capital A capital R capital T. So That's what, right. what are smart goals and why do you apply this, uh, strategy when you're coaching athletes? And this goes back to my 19 years as a high school teacher. <laughs> we use smart goals. This is this has been in the in the works for a long time. But it applies to all goals and running goals. We need to make the goals, our goals, attainable, right? We can't just like arbitrarily choose a goal for our marathon and say, you know, if I just wake up one morning and I want a marathon like Michael, I want to be like, I want to run a 240 marathon. That's it. That's what I want to do. I have to say, hold on, wait a second. And as a coach, I say, hold on, hold on, Caitlin, wait a second. Let's take a look at this. Let's step back and let's make a smart goal. So are we going, are we going to go through the acronym, Michael? Let's do this. Cause are we going to go? Uh, all right. I, I wonder if we have the same, <laughs> the same acronym here because, uh, okay. I went, I went based off like the, 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 the dorky, like business school approach to using smart goals. Cause this was, I'll give you a little, like a little uh, history lesson here on what the, where Ooh, smart comes from in a second, but wait, what's your, what's your acronym stand for? Okay. I've got specific, measurable, achievable, relevant, and time bound. For those of you who haven't heard of the smart goals before, I have a, what do you I have a variation on the theme. I got specific as well. Okay. So we're on the same page. Okay. I got me- <laughs> okay I got good, good. Then I got assignable, okay. which I think it's because oh. in like management consulting, assignable is like, you know, makes a lot more sense. Right. But I guess I, I sort yeah. of apply that in my own head to like, if you're your own boss in, in, in marathoning, right. you're, you're, to, to use a Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles reference here, if you're Krang inside of that robot that he controls, <laughs> you're pulling the levers okay. on your own body. You're your own, you're your own marathon boss. You get to be Krang. So whew, children. I love it. I love it that we're from the same generation, children Michael. Be, we can talk. Alex wouldn't even understand. He doesn't what even we're know what a, right a Ninja Turtle Teenage. is. <laughs> Alex. Sorry, Alex, you're not here to defend yourself Let's on pick that. On poor Alex. Um, <laughs> he picked a week to go on vacation, didn't he? Um, okay, yeah. yeah. Okay, so that's right. Assi- I'm, I'm at A, right? Okay, assignable. assignable. And then realistic is the R. And then, oh, okay. Which we can, we can riff on that too, right? Because I think that's a huge yep. component to goal setting. Huge. Right. Uh, <laughs> and a big problem with, uh, with 
with running, <laughs> being realistic yes. with yourself, uh, and then time, uh -huh. and then time related, uh, which would be just creating a time frame for achieving these goals that's realistic and that you can you can kind of telescope out and plan a proper uh, appropriately. So, right, we'll stick with yours, but I, I'll sort of add my thoughts based on on this uh, on my version of the acronym, and I will say. Because I uh, I promised it off the top, uh, I I did a little rabbit hole reading on where this came from, and it was coined by. I love when you do this research. <laughs> coined by a go for it. boy George T. Doran in the November 1981 issue of the Management Review, which okay. I believe is a academic periodical. I don't know if it's still <laughs> around anymore. I don't know if they're still cranking out the Management Review. Maybe they are. But uh, that's where this thing comes from. It's something that we've all heard of before. We've all heard about SMART goals before. But yeah. we're going to use SMART goal, the idea of uh, using of building out SMART goals, just to frame this first section as we talk about yeah. how we do this whole marathon goal setting thing. Okay, so let's talk about it. Yes. Let's start with specific. Let's go yeah. for it. Let's go with specific. So we want to be like, okay. I want to complete a marathon. That's what we're talking about right here. So if it's any distance, you know, I want to complete my 5K, but we're, we're focusing on the marathon. So I want to complete my marathon. That's a specific goal. We can make it much more specific with time, right? If it's time-based, but that's more kind of moving into measurable. Like I want to complete the marathon. I want to do a sub four marathon or I want to do a sub three marathon, or I just want to finish the marathon healthy and, and <laughs> safely and get across that finish line. Um, and then is, you know, if I say I want to run a sub four marathon, is that achievable? So that's the, the, you know, the next part that we're going to there, like do my previous races, my training log, my tests, which we're going to get into in a little bit, do they reveal that my paces are enough to be able to work towards the sub four marathon? Is this actually realistic for me or do I need to kind of take a step back or is it actually going to be too easy and I need to to maybe um, adjust there. Um, relevant, I guess we would talk about in general, is this marathon going to, does this marathon time and this marathon goal align with kind of all of my fitness goals or my life in general? Am I being <laughs> honest with myself? Yes. <laughs> exactly. Am I lying? Am I being honest? Am I lying to myself? And the time bound goal, you know, for those of you out there who decided, I don't know, October, I'm, yeah, I don't know. Someone gave me this number for New York and I'm going to run it next month. That, okay, probably that is not very time bound. We want to make sure that we have enough time to train for our goal as well. So make sure that you have the specific amount of time uh, to train for the specific goal that you want. What, what do you have to add in there, Michael? Oh, these are all great. And in fact, I feel like you were like, we, we were, you could just the, we could overlay m many of our notes and they just sort of like literally read the exact same way with this specific <laughs> in terms of like, yeah, just, I, I went, I wrote down literally if it, whether it be sub three, sub four, just finishing, particularly if it's your first marathon, yeah. which is a totally noble goal. Now I would say right. that um, just finishing should also entail the process that we're going to talk about sort of process based uh, goal setting as well uh, in, in the next segment here. But I think that that's a really important factor because otherwise you get the, um, you get the, the cliche of the couch to marathon where the person's like literally two weeks before the marathon, they're like, I'm going to sign up for a marathon and complete a marathon <laughs> so that I can put that on my like life resume or my Tinder, you know, profile or whatever. It's like, <laughs> Ran or it's my bucket list. I just want to check it yeah. off and not really yeah. train for it in the way that's necessary. Yeah, yeah we're not totally. talking about bucket listing. And I think that if you're right. if you're listening to this podcast and you're you're probably at at some stage of dying yourself in the wool, being the the dyed wool of being a marathon runner. If that if that is an analogy, I can work. I never actually tried to talk to frame <laughs> being dyed in the wool in that way before. But yeah, if you're into if you're into running to the degree that you're listening to running podcasts, I think you've graduated past the kind of BS approach of just like, I'm just going to struggle through this without having trained for it. So we're talking about it right. with some training involved, right? Yeah. I, um, right. yeah, I would say that, uh, 
as you said before, with the realistic approach, and we can unpack this in a bit more detail, but like, it's really tricky, mm -hmm. particularly when you're, when you're early, early on the marathon running journey to kind of identify exactly what you should be targeting. If when we're talking about external kind of time-based outcomes, like mm -hmm. sub, sub four, sub three, BQ, whatever. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. We'll get into that, those specifics down, down the line here in this chat, but, um, yeah. So how do you start applying smart, uh, smart goals to, to, to enhance marathon training? Exactly. Okay. Well, I think, um, when you're speaking to your coach or if you're figuring out on your own, I think one of the most important things that you need to do is really have a handle on your fitness level and not just, I mean, I have absolutely had athletes and myself uh, way back in the day before my coaching days, you know, choosing this arbitrary, uh, goal for myself and thinking that I would be able to, to achieve it without really doing, you know, the research first and, check my training logs and check what I've been doing recently and just say, wait a second, is this actually possible? Um, so what I would do, and as a coach and what I have my athletes do a lot of the time to check their fitness level is I love doing a test. I mean, I'm sure all of the athletes hate taking the test. Uh, the, fit, the fitness <laughs> test. Yeah. The fitness test. I'm a big one. Like if, if you don't have a very recent 5k or 10k time, then we're going to take a fitness test. So it's probably either going to be a 3k or 5k, which is not fun. Okay. Yeah. Right. I know. I know it gives me anxiety also because it's like a one shot deal. Um, running a 3k or 5k or 10k as absolutely fast as you can without burning out kind of like trying to take tests and doing them well. Someone can also be really good at taking tests or someone can kind of, like Michael's saying, have a lot of anxiety and have trouble taking those tests. But we'll take that, that data, that time, that total time. And I love to use Jack Daniels VDOT calculator. I feel like all the times that I've used it, it's been pretty accurate. Um, and so, you know, we plug those times in it spits out some estimations for us. It gives us training paces. And we kind of take a look at that to get a guideline of like, this is this is where we are right now. And then there's always, which I'd like to hear Michael's uh, thought on this. If, if during the marathon process, if you retest a few months later or you don't retest, that's something, that's always something that's that's in there that I have my my opinions about. But at least you want to start off with some sort of a test, some sort of a guideline and say, okay, this is what right now is my estimated marathon time. And we, is that, is that how, how would you do no, it? That's great. I, and we should, yeah. we should say that Jack Daniels is a exercise physiologist in the U S not a, um, maker of, of fine, uh, Tennessee whiskey. Uh, although I love the, I, Oh yes. I love the <laughs> Sorry, idea yes. that like, there's a dude that distills whiskey somewhere in, in, in rural America and also is a master at programming in, uh, uh, you know, endurance athletes, uh, training. I love that idea. I love that. <laughs> I love hilarious. the idea that they would be the same person, but alas, they are not. Yeah. No. Um, yeah, I, I've, I've used VDOT over the years. VDOT is nice because okay. it's this number. Um, you can also use any other version of metrics. Uh, this is where not to plug, uh, coach Caitlin Tossi's, uh, excellent, <laughs> uh, coaching abilities, but this is where having a coach or someone that you can get feedback from someone who's experienced can help you make these decisions, mm -hmm. right. Who has this, uh, this expertise, this knowledge of like how to define that number, uh, and to, to time you on one of these, uh, um, one of these, in, in, you know, fitness tests, an alternative, of course, is just get yourself in a local 5K and suffer through it yep. and then get that number. And, um, you know, if you don't like that number, I don't know, do another one in a couple of weeks, I guess. Do it but, again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, and which is tricky, but I think being honest with yourself and being okay with starting at whatever the starting point is and, ex and also embracing this idea that it's a, it's, it's the, the situation is fluid. Uh, that they, that your fitness is going to change and improve over time. Uh, and right. that if you want to get into the game of measuring your fitness every month or so, either in a workout or with a, you have to be careful about a, 
a, a run being like a race being too demanding because you're going to have to recover. Mm -hmm. Like I wouldn't recommend doing a half right. marathon every month to test your fitness over the course of a training cycle because a half marathon will start to eat away at you over time and right. you won't be able to run your long run or you'll have to take a couple of days off to recover, that sort of thing. So, but a 5k you can bounce back on, you can replace a workout, that sort of thing here and there. Uh, I would consult with a coach on that one or stick to your training program. And yep. my main piece of advice here, and this is something that I have to remind myself as I start a, a training cycle is your numbers, your paces, especially if you get a, a training plan and you're looking at it and saying, you know, run this block of lactate threshold pace, which is just a fancy word for basically kind of what you can do all out in one hour. But it's it's working a, a physiological system in your body, which is very important for distance running. If your program says run this amount of tempo or or lactate threshold or whatever way you want to call it, that mm -hmm. that number might and probably will improve over time. But it's cool to start at a certain point. You're say you're trying to break. So you're trying to break three hours for a marathon. I know it's a pretty ambitious goal for a lot of people, but say you're trying to break. I would Caitlin, love that one day. Say, yes, say that's Caitlin, my, yes. for example, you're trying to break three hours in a marathon. <laughs> Just we'll pull a number out of the sky Oof. here. Um, oh, boy. You don't need to go and just like identify what the lactate threshold range is for the sub three hour marathon and identify what the marathon pace is specifically for 259.59 and then just hold yourself to that from day one because that's not what your body understands and it's not where your body is at you need exactly. to figure out where your exactly. body is at start at that point and then hey maybe it's 306 right now maybe that's kind of the right. ballpark you're in you might be able to work towards three hours you might not this is where goal setting is important. You got to kind of like telegraph out. Maybe it's going to take you two or three cycles of training to get right. to the sub three ballpark. You may not be a sub three runner. Who knows? But I, if you're like in a right. starting point of 306, you're probably going to be able to get to sub three at some point. And the same goes for any other distance. I know maybe I'm using a, a big kind of um, uh, ambitious number for a lot of our listeners, yes. but it's same, it same goes with sub four as well. So that's my thinking. Yeah. I think that it's, um, you know, I think maybe a lot of marathon runners, especially if you're, if you're just starting out and you're in your first or your second marathon, I think it's super important to understand because in the beginning, um, it's amazing because there's so much progress yeah. so quickly. I feel like it's, oh, it's I incredible. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. yeah. I absolutely love it. I love training uh, new runners as well, because it's just so exciting to see those big leaps and jumps and goals. And I remember that I was in, you know, like a fitness plateau where for three years, my 3k test was just like shaving seconds off, just like a few seconds off. And so that get, and you have to understand that, that those seconds are still gold. You know, it might feel frustrating, but don't get so frustrated uh, with those seconds because it gets harder and harder to shave those seconds down. And I think that that's super important when you're thinking about goals is to be like kind to yourself and not think that like, no, every time I'm going to, you know, shave half an hour off my marathon, like it's, it's impossible. <laughs> you just have to be, you know, well, not impossible. Nothing's impossible, but you know what I mean? Like you just have to, um, be kind to yourself with that kind of stuff and, and be patient because I've, I have some amazing friends, uh, runners here in Costa Rica who I have watched just fly and they do a lot of sub threes, uh, you know, uh, sub and they're, they're, they're shaving just minutes off every year and they're working so incredibly hard. So all of that is, you know, it has a lot of value. Um, every minute counts. And so just remember that, that it's not like always shaving off a ton of time. Like a couple minutes can be a really big deal. So you just have to put everything in perspective when you're putting your goals together. I just had a little aha moment where I was like, future pod <laughs> from our uh, us two middle-aged uh, hack runners is, <laughs> is the, what do you do when you've plateaued? How do you set goals that are yeah. time-based goals? Um, well, that's a good one. We'll put a pin on that for a future pod. That's a good, uh, yeah. that's a good Caitlin Michael episode. And the next time Alex is, yeah. uh, uh, next time our, our 20 something, um, our old Gen Z yes. young, young millennial is, uh, is on vacation again because he's got yep. so much time left, but, um, we'll pivot. <laughs> Actually, let's pivot into, this is a great opportunity to unpack this 
whole idea of process-based goals versus outcome-based yep. goals. We've Nice segue, Caitlin. Just chef's yeah. kiss there. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about the difference between the two. What's what, tell, tell me what a process-based goal is, and then, and then we can get into outcome-based goals as well. Okay. And if you're a, a listener uh, who's, who's heard a lot of these podcasts, we've mentioned this a couple of times. I think we actually even gave some of our, our preferences. I feel like I, as a runner, I'm a very process-based goal runner. I love process-based goals. It's more looking at the training rather than the race. So you're looking at your whole training process, the whole cycle, um, each phase within the cycle and process-based goals are basically like getting there. And I, you know, skills, routines, maybe you want to, uh, quicken your cadence. Maybe, I mean, even, you know, maybe you want to eat a healthier diet uh, maybe you want to work on your posture. Maybe you want to make sure you get enough sleep for all of you sleep deprived runners. Out there. Yeah, yeah. I'm working <laughs> on it. I'm working on it. <laughs> there are a lot of process-based goals we can look at. And I am one of those people who absolutely loves to train. The race anxiety is something that like I'll do it and I'm enjoying when I'm at the race, but I prefer to train a million times more than I than race day. So um, I really enjoy process-based goals and I think that they're important um, uh, within the training cycle to kind of enjoy those and set those mini goals throughout uh, throughout the process. Yeah. I think like knowing yourself is really important with distance running. And it's this incredible opportunity for, for you to, to learn more about who you are as a person, um, because you're putting yourself under stress, you're putting yourself into adverse situations, um, which is a really beneficial thing. It's like, a, a for, in terms of like personal development and growth, uh, it's mm -hmm. very valuable distance running. And I would say knowing whether or not you're a process-based person or an outcome-based motivated person person is a really important uh, factor in understanding how to become a more complete marathon runner. So I would say mm -hmm. I am like you, Caitlin. I, yeah. I'm, I love the process. I love training. I love the, I love the odyssey of training, uh, the story yeah. of training. And yeah, I like the outcome. Uh, I like some racing. I don't love racing. Whereas I know many runners who are all about racing and the training is just a means to an end to race and they love right. signing up for races and they're going to do throughout a marathon build. They'll do like five K's in the summer, 10 K's towards the end of the summer. And then they'll want to do one half marathon and they'll be itching to do a second half marathon in their block, but they'll back off because they want to nail the marathon. And I'm not like that. And as I've aged, I've actually, and kind of matured and become more, you know, experienced and, and, and self-aware with what I'm capable of in a marathon, I've done less racing. And that's in part, <laughs> probably me avoiding something I don't really enjoy, which is those are those outcome based drivers. <laughs> so I would say to become a more complete runner, you almost want to know what version of a runner you are. Are you a process person or an outcome person? We're all kind okay. of both. Uh, but if you're more an outcome person, maybe you want to challenge yourself in order to become a better marathon runner to focus on process more. Um, and that's a good, that's a good, like a little, doing a little Russian nesting doll thing here. That's a good, like goal within the goal. Right. Um, right. Yeah. But in my case, maybe I need to race more, stick my neck out, mm -hmm. you know, embrace a little bit of uh, safe failure so that I can learn a little bit more about myself along the way. Uh, challenge myself more with more racing. But so let's pivot to talking about outcome based goals because I think they can be dangerous and they're important to understand. Yeah. And they're, I think, for a lot of our listeners, for both of us, the outcome based goal is the huge driver in what you're doing. Um, and it's kind of how often you shape your training and you shape your goal setting, right? It's like, Right. Yeah. So tell them what's, what's it. All right. Let's get into this. Yeah. So outcome-based goals, as you can probably um, decipher, are centered more around the race, right? So your outcome-based goal will be, did I finish the marathon? If your goal was, I just want to finish the marathon. Was I able to finish the marathon? Or did I get my sub three? Did I get my sub four? Did I get my sub five? Did I get my time? Maybe even some, um, some runners are actually trying uh, to place 
right? So they, they say, okay, within my uh, category, within my age category, I want to place within the top five, the top 10, uh, the top three. So you have all of these different outcome-based goals. Uh, and I think it's great to have outcome-based goals. And I think we're going to pivot into something super important about outcome-based goals, because just having one uh, is a little dangerous. <laughs> having one big outcome-based goal, um, because it's very easy for something to go wrong on race day. And it's very easy to not hit your outcome-based goal. So I think it's, I think that's why it's important to have, you know, your process goals. I mean, to me, there's nothing better than having like just a really awesome workout where I said, like, I hit all my paces. I feel amazing. And you have a lot more chances to have great workouts <laughs> than you do the big race. So I think they're like nice little mini victories that you can celebrate along the way, kind of like to motivate you um, to work towards your, your outcome-based goals. Before we move on to the next, uh, next segment within this uh, conversation about uh, you know, marathon based goals. I want to, uh, I want to define something that I, I kind of like this. I think, uh, if you're listening out there and you're, uh, and you're in running media, don't steal this, please. Uh, Caitlin, <laughs> please steal it. Uh, cause we're on the same okay. team. I call it the sub trap and this is an <laughs> outcome based goal, uh, pitfall. It's the sub four, sub three, sub two fifty, sub two forty, sub two thirty, the sub whatever trap. Yep. Yeah. Uh a, a cousin of the That's sub trap one. is the the BQ trap. The yes. I need to BQ. I need to run whatever it is below the BQ for my age group in order to make sure I qualify. The Boston qualifier, like to get into Boston. And while that stuff is hugely motivating. It's also yep. very ego driven. And this is the nice segue into the role of the A, <laughs> B, and C and base C. goals. And I also yes. got uh, D, E, F. <laughs> D, e, F. <laughs> just keep it, keep it going. Really, yeah. like as many I, uh... as you want. But just not, not exactly. just A, not just an A goal. So let's talk yeah. about how you implement, both as a runner and as a coach working with athletes. A, B, and C goals, and and just you know, for the person out there that is totally new to all this, and they're like, "Hold on, do I need more than like just finishing as my goal, or more than just sub four hours is my goal?" Because that's what my roommate ran last fall, and I want to kick their ass, you know. Like, <laughs> let's let's define yeah. the, the, the 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 A, B, and Cs. Okay, I I of course use A, B, and C goals for myself, and I when I sit down with my athletes and we're we're starting to figure out the whole process, and throughout the process we have to you know adjust goals. Except we I always suggest that we put together an A, B, and C, and it's worked out really well. And sometimes you get your A, which is the super ambitious goal, right? That you've been training for it's not that it's out of your reach but it's it, it's really ambitious and you need the stars to align and you've got to have a great day and you're going to have no tummy trouble <laughs> you got to be able to oh boy always back to it <laughs> i promise we wouldn't talk about um, poop this time okay let's stay focused, stay focused. nope i I'm, I'm 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 staying out of it okay um you know nothing happens you have no niggles nothing's bothering you during a race all the stars align and you're able to get your super ambitious goal that you've been excited about but if the stars do not align which i wonder if my stars have ever aligned you have to go to b so b is a realistic but attainable goal, but still challenging. Don't think that like we're throwing in something that just isn't easy and you just have like a cop out. It's not that. It's just that that first A goal is pretty ambitious. And the second one is a little more realistic where like you could think something could go wrong. I could forget to take a couple of gels and maybe still get there. Or I could feel, you know, it could be a little hotter out than I expected, um, but I would still be able to keep that pace. So I would say, you know, that could be your B goal. And then for C, you want to have sort of a fallback goal. That's something you're still going to be proud of, but something that, you know, it just, this wasn't the day, it wasn't in the cards. And and I just, usually I never, well, I never like to say times or anything for races because, and it's not that I feel I'm not superstitious or anything. I just feel like embarrassed about what I'm trying to work towards, or I don't know. I don't usually talk about my times, but for the marathon that I just ran, I had three goals. I had the A, B, and C goal. And the A was a time that I had been training for, that I had been shooting for. The B 
was a, a time that I still thought was, was fast for me. And that, you know, I was going to be reaching for that. I would be super happy. And my third goal was, well, I want a PR. Okay. So I've got, you know, my super ambitious goal, the training paces I've been working on for all of these months. The second one where, okay, I'd be super happy. This is just like a little under the training pace and okay, beat my PR. And in, in Revel, I got my seagull. Okay. It wasn't my best day. I got my seagull, but I was super psyched because I was still able to PR, even though it wasn't what I'd been working towards all those months. And so you still feel motivated. And during the race, you know, when you're in a marathon, you know, if you're on pace or you're not on pace, there are signs everywhere. You know what mile you're in all the time. And so if you're looking down at your watch and you're figuring it out, you're like, all right, yeah. Okay. I'm just not going to make it. Let's switch over to B or let's switch over to C, you know, but let's just keep going and stay motivated. And I think that helps you get through it and be proud of what you're, 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 you're working for. You got, you got any good stories for that, for that, Michael? Oh, I mean, you know, well, <laughs> we're going to do a, a, a DNF pod when we get Alex back from vacay and, uh, unpack. Oh, yeah. Is it ever okay to DNF? What is a DNF that do that did not finish? So I won't, I won't, I won't stamp on that too much. Just stay tuned. Subscribe, yeah. subscribe our, to our <laughs> podcast so you can hear us talk about our uh, DNF stories. Um, and yeah, you guys don't want to miss it. Yeah. We've got some story. We've got some doozies. <laughs> <laughs> Spoiler alert. Caitlin gets dragged off the course in a hundred miler. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so no, I, I think that I think I always have at least an A, B and a C. And sometimes I, as I, as I said yep. before, I, I, I throw in a D an E, maybe even an F. Yep. And what I do is I actually, what often motivates you to sign up for a marathon is you're like, I got something to prove something I want to do something I want to achieve. It's often the A goal, right? It's the, I want to qualify for Boston. It's the, I want to finally crack three hours in the marathon. It's the, right. you know. I've been running for two years since the pandemic started. Uh, I feel like pretty fit. I'm starting to try these long run things and maybe I want to do a sub four hour marathon as my first marathon. You know, that's like a pretty ambitious goal for a lot of people. And that's awesome. Right. So you're, you're kind of coming into it with that a goal. And then what I do is I start my training block. Usually I, you got to, as, as Co coach Caitlin just said, you got to figure out your starting point, do a fitness test. Right get some sense of where you're at. Then you start training with those numbers in mind, with a training plan in mind, find yourself a training plan. It's a site marathonhandbook.com. We've got training oh, plans. I've heard yes. of it. I've heard of it. Yeah. All it's a good one. It's for everything, every distance, every time-based goal, just finishing goals, first marathon, and so on and yep. so forth. Or ping Caitlin. She'll help you. Uh, so don't ping me. Uh, but, uh, um, uh <laughs> Don't ping me. I'm not a coach, but, uh, I can give you some informal <laughs> advice if you'd like, but, uh, yeah, have that a goal in mind. And then you start kind of working through your season, working through your training block. You start thinking about how the a goal is going, uh, whether or not it's realistic, as we were saying before, if it's fitting in your time plan and then also start thinking about the B and the C goals. And then I revisit my a goal when things are getting closer to marathon time to go time. And I start asking myself tough questions. Did this season, did the, did the, the training program go according to plan? How mm -hmm. many long runs have I done? How's the volume been? What are the numbers looking like? What are the workout numbers looking like? Maybe you ran another fitness test or, uh, a prep race along the way. What did that number point to fire it into a few different calculators? Use the, there's the Macmillan calculator, Google yep. Macmillan running calculator. That's a good one. Use the, the, mm -hmm. the V dot calculator. You're going to get all of these different numbers and you can put in some different parameters. We have a calculator, put it into our calculator. Don't pick the sexiest number. Don't pick the one that's like, <sighs> you know, you're, you're going to kill it. You're breaking three for sure. Whereas the other three are like <laughs> 306, dude, oh, you're 306. Uh -huh, sorry. Exactly. Yeah, yep. maybe, you know, be honest with yourself, figure, and that's a way you can kind of like refine your a goal when you get closer to race day. But throughout the season, I always, uh, spend a little bit of time, especially when you're doing like one of those easy runs middle of the week by yourself, instead of like, uh, instead of listening to your favorite running podcast or, uh, or just enjoying thoughtless silence for an hour, 
Uh, start working through that idea of what the B and the C's are. What is something that will motivate you, uh, that will inspire you to continue working through a very hard process, which is running a, a goal race, running a marathon? What's going to drive you to get through that? What are you okay with? Um, what will still, what what will still, yeah, inspire you to keep going? which is right. a, a huge factor, particularly if you're pivoting off of your A goal. And also something that I keep in mind, in the marathon, there's no marathon is going to be sparkling in a clean sheet. Every marathon mm -hmm. is going to have its, its ups and downs, its, uh, its challenges. So you need to be able to maybe pivot off that A goal temporarily, you know, and then settle down. Maybe your heart rate was a little high because you're running the Chicago marathon and there's 45,000 people around you and you're not used to it for the, it's the first time you've ever run a major marathon in your life. And you're like, it's freaking you out. And the first five, 10 mm K -hmm. you're not settled. And you're like this a goal, I'm hitting this number, but I'm really stressed and my heart rate's really high. And it's just, this feels mm -hmm. really hard. But maybe you just needed a few K to kind of tamp things down, chill things out, and then you can pivot from goal A to goal B. And then by maybe kilometer 15, you're like, I feel really good. Suddenly it's feeling mm -hmm. easy again. Crank it up. Bring it back to goal A, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, so then goal C, I like, Caitlin, I like actually having a goal that I can go back on that's like not, that is not a time-based goal. I like to have a goal. That's a good idea. Yeah. And I'm mm -hmm. like, especially if I, I'm a guy who's always going after, you know, numbers that are, I understand, like they're not numbers everyone's running, like, you know, a sub 240 marathon or whatever. But it may surprise some to hear, but like, I like to have the just finishing as a goal. Like that is something yep. that you need to think about and put into context that marathoning is hard. And what we're doing yep. is taking a big risk with these A and these B, B goals and we're putting it out there and it may not pan out for you. Um, mm -hmm. But you should be proud that you're do you've done the marathon. Uh, and those who know me, I'm sure you're rolling your eyes right now. You're like, oh, you know, there here we goes. go. <laughs> um, or like what, what BS, he's obsessed with times. But I actually always do backload this idea in my mind. I spend time throughout the season thinking about this where I'm like, every marathon is an experience. It's a little mm -hmm. mini epic. I like to describe it as it's like a little odyssey unto itself. And it's something that I can guarantee you, you will not be happy with yourself. If you step off the course, I can guarantee you right. finishing is more, uh, is always rewarding on some level. And yep. the, the ego and giving up. Yeah. The, the ego pain of not delivering on the goal time you were thinking you were going to hit hurts in the short term, but in the long term, yep. having finished the race is always valuable. So I always have that in the back pocket. I'm like, yeah, things get really dark and I've made some horrible decisions throughout the race where I've got myself in trouble. I'm just going to get this thing done. So I would always say yep. back pocket that finishing. Um, Absolutely. No. And I think that you are actually segueing or teasing even more into our podcast about the DNFing, mm -hmm. because I think this is something that we are really going to unpack in that episode. So, you know, thinking about two things that you mentioned, one, finishing and the importance of finishing and not being like, no, I'm just going to give up and just step off because I'm not going to get my time, which I think is, you know, no, we'll get into that later. And the other one is problem solving which is a huge thing, right? Problem solving throughout the race. How are you going to problem solve throughout the race? As you just mentioned, Michael, about like every marathon has its ups and downs. Every marathon is going to have a, an issue, whether it's going to be the weather that you're unprepared for or whether, or you can try and prepare for, or whether it's going to be, I don't know, something ended up happening with an aid station and they didn't have something that you needed, or you were banking on seeing someone at this mile point and they couldn't get there for you. So you didn't get your bottle or I don't know, something, something could always go wrong. So I think problem solving is a super important thing that we need to keep in mind and we'll, and we'll get, get into later to not, you know, get too off topic, but I thought that was important to kind of, you know, shout there. And about just finishing being a goal and not having, you know, time-based goals. It could also be something like that. Like this race, 
I'm not going to hit the wall at 32. <laughs> this race, I'm going to get my fueling right. This race, so you can have other goals like that, that, that are super important and other details that don't have to do so much with, you know, the time or the position uh, you finish in. Yeah. And I'll, I'll give a little shout out to uh, someone I'm surprised that I'm going to give a shout out to because uh, I'm not sure how I feel about him as a human being, especially having read a lengthy feature about him a couple of months ago that detailed his rather grim personal life uh, and behavior. But uh, the famed podcaster and neuroscientist, Andrew Huberman, who's, who's Alex's boy. Uh, Alex actually has a really good video on our YouTube about um about how we tried to to live the live the the Huberman method for a month uh, and see if it affected his running in a positive way. Uh, and right, I'll give Huberman a lot of credit. He's got a a great pod on um, goal setting, uh, in sort of in the abstract kind of like life goal setting for the most part. But there's a lot of interesting uh, details, and that'll put it in the show notes. Actually, it's worth sharing. And it's a lengthy pod, so it's like an hour and a half long. But there's a lot in there. I think there's a lot in there for marathon runners as well. And one of the takeaways for me is like a couple of things he said that I thought were really interesting were, one, you have to keep in mind that making mistakes or making errors is a really valuable component to a process. To And you have to actually allow for, and there's some research done on this, you have to allow for about 15% of the time to make errors throughout a training process in our case with the marathon and also in the race itself mm -hmm. in order to become better right. at the marathon, embrace this idea, like you said, problem solving and embrace this yep. idea that this, that the marathon is not going to be a perfect experience. It's not going to be, right. it's not going to be just like your a goal gets smashed and it's this extraordinary, you know, better than your wildest dreams uh, you know, your float to the finish line. Marath that is not the marathon. It's not the reason why we're drawn to it. It's, mm -hmm. um, it's not the reason why it has a reputation. It has, I mean, it's, it's literally named after a, a place and time in history where a dude ran for a really long time to achieve an end goal and then died, then right? Died. So, you know, <laughs> right. it's got that reputation. But uh, yeah, uh, Huberman in his in his pod on goal setting refers to a paper that basically is like it's a total fallacy that sorry Kipchoge that nothing is impossible and you need to like you need to do this thing that I think a lot of people these days lean into because like the Instagramification of our lives where it's just like try you know have like massive hubris and just try stuff and like you know you're you don't know what you're po you're capable of. So just like really try and reach really, really far and you will achieve your dreams. Uh, that's a mm -hmm. terrible approach apparently, but then also being super conservative and being like incremental mm -hmm. about your progress and, you know, really careful and setting yourself up for success so that it's all very sort of um, easy, easy and, mm -hmm. and, and mm -hmm. reassuring and, and, right. uh, and confidence boosting would be a nice way of saying it. Ego, Right. Uh, feeding would be another way of saying it is also a poor uh, approach. And the science says, try to aim for about 85% success and 15% making mistakes because your brain right. plasticity apparently um, is reacts to those mistakes, but you can't make too many of them because then it gets chaotic, but you need to insert about 15%. So think about it when you're running your marathon and maybe not everything's going according to plan. Just embrace this idea that like, hey, my, 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 my brain is growing in plasticity and I'm going to, and I'm getting better at this, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And you can practice those things. Be like, okay, you know, this is a tough moment. Let's think about how I can learn from this. So I, I, mm -hmm. I would say that's a, a really beneficial approach or really like to think about Coach Caitlin, I want to pick your brain about this, but to think about okay. it all being a process, right? Uh, to go back to process-based mm -hmm. goal setting, where it's like every race is not is every race is an opportunity to practice for the next race and to learn from yep. your mistakes for the next race. It's not the be all end. Yep. Exactly, and I think what you mentioned about you know if you flew through the finish line 
so swiftly and easily for your eagle, then it wasn't an eagle, right? So we have to get back to that as well. Like an eagle has to be an ambitious goal and it has to be challenging. And so then you would have fallen into that group of, you know, no, I'm just going to make the goal super attainable and super easy. So I just get like this great confidence boost. But I think at the end of the day, we all know uh, if that wasn't challenging enough for us and, you know, to try to, to try to push ourselves a little bit and have that ABC and push ourselves for those really ambitious goals and, and see if we can get there. So I think that's why, you know, I think that's one of the reasons why we're going into all of this and why it's so important because maybe it seems like a pretty simple thing to do. And we all say, yeah, but I can just set a goal, but there's really a lot that goes into it to make sure, you know, it's not too tough. It's not too easy. Um, it's going to make you feel good. You know, you're going to be proud of it. And yeah, sometimes we're going to have a lot of ups or we're almost always going to have ups and downs. I know I've spoken a bunch about um, my girl, Courtney DeWalter, before the famous, oh, the best ultra marathoner, I think, in the world. She always talks about her pain cave and her goal. This was her goal in um, Western, uh, no, in Hard Rock that she just ran a couple of months ago, that she just won and broke her own record. When everyone interviews her before the races, you know, they're always wanting her to say something about time, about place, about record breaking. And what she said before the last Hard Rock race was, my number one goal is to spend less time in the pain cave this time around than last year. That was her A goal. And guess what? She said she did not achieve it. She, <laughs> she uh, spent a lot more time. <laughs> she did some she 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 did some rearranging of the furniture in the pain cave. Maybe she yep. installed a new LED panel to watch the Olympics this <laughs> summer in the pain cave. She vacuumed the pain cave. She had a nap in yeah, the pain so... cave. She woke up screaming in the pain cave. Yeah. Yeah. Actually that, that actually to, uh, to do another hat tip to to our boy Hubes here is, uh, he talks about how there's a lot of science around, uh, the fa again, the fallacy of positive visualization and the reality that negative visualization is actually more effective, which surprised me to hear because, wow. yeah. So this whole idea okay. of like constantly visualizing yourself crossing the finish line, you know, two fifty nine, fifty nine, and then you're leaning and dipping and getting it or whatever. And this is an incredible moment is in fact, less effective and can be not effective at all, apparently, according to some studies, oh. by comparison to instead engaging your amygdala, a portion of your brain, that is the, uh -huh. the flight or fear res response uh, gets triggered in that uh, area of your brain. And that's apparently more powerful than the reward-based system uh, where you're like, you know, it's positive, 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 where instead it's like, it's Tuesday. It's 7 30 PM. It's pissing rain outside. You've got, uh, I don't know, eight miles to run It's mid season. You're straining to be motivated. And apparently thinking about it in terms of like, if I don't do this on marathon day, I may fail is actually more mm -hmm. motivating and actually mm -hmm produces more success. And I okay. don't wonder, I don't know if there's been any studies done on this, but like, I don't, and I don't know how you would even do a study, like rig up the little, like, you know, the sensors on the brain or whatever, but like <laughs> while running a marathon, but I, I don't wonder if like in the beginning of a marathon, the start, go, the starting gun pistol, that weird beeping noise goes, we're all running and you're so caught up and you're tempted to run a little faster because it feels so easy because you've tapered and you're like, oh, it's going to be amazing. I'm going to break my eagle. I should adjust my eagle to make it even better. What am I doing? I'm so awesome. Mm -hmm. His suggestion is instead you should be like, be afraid because this could go really badly. <laughs> you know, be, tamp it down, stick to your conservative, to your number, maybe even mm -hmm. start off with the B goal and not the A goal. As long as you can uh -huh. bridge the gap between the B and the A. So maybe if you're trying to run under four hours for the marathon, maybe don't start off at 340 marathon pace and be like, oh, right, I'm right. banking time for down the line. Instead, have some healthy respect and fear for what if I don't succeed? What if I fail? You know, like, yeah. um, 
That's a lot of good stuff. Yeah. No, no, that, that's a lot of good stuff there because I have to be honest, like right, right the week before I'm going to run a race or I'm going to a trail race or whatever, I am literally doing my easy runs, just like picturing finish line, oh, yeah. excited. I, I do that. I'm, oh so my gosh. I. Yeah, totally, okay. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. But I have to be honest because you just reminded me of a route that I always run about once a month. And it's, you know, just to kind of put in a little context, it's like a 26 K route. But it has like 1,600 meters of vertical gain. It is a killer. The Excellent. first hill is like seven kilometers and it's got 1,000 meters of gain. So I'm climbing this hill and every single <sighs> time I turn to my running and I'm like, what? why are we doing this? Why again have we chosen to go up this treacherous hill? Like not treacherous because it's not dangerous, but just like this incredibly steep hill where we're not having a good time. And I think that maybe subconsciously I'm doing, I'm thinking of that, you know, like, okay, I'm going to put myself in those really tough situations. I'm going to feel the pain. So when I'm in a race, those hills don't feel as bad. So I guess, you know, you I'm kind of working. Yeah. If and I, I don't think that do this, I, I will fail. Yeah. 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 So there, there you go. I think you can kind of, maybe you can have like a happy equilibrium of both and kind of work it in there. I like it. And I like that idea of to flip back to the kind of process base versus outcome base, that kind of rolls nicely into the idea of the of the process, right? And embracing the, the yep. process based goal setting, where you're like, I'm going to build in all of this sort of um, narrative structure or these experiences in my life, uh, and with my running practice to get a little corny, but like I'm going to, I'm going to have these roots. I'm going to have these. I'm going to have these uh, little challenges along the way these reminders these mm -hmm. these tough segments or sequences in my run where i'm going to have there's like a little bit of a healthy fear and and apprehension where i'm like this is hard this is hard right. and this is humbling and on a on a day where i'm tired and i've done a lot of mileage and it's like mid-season uh it's tamping me down a little bit but it's keeping me kind of uh aware that I'm still not there yet. You know, I, I love all of that. Mm -hmm. I think, I think yeah. embracing all of that is one of the special aspects of this whole marathon. Uh, the cult of the marathon that we are definitely members of. Right. So, um, <laughs> yes, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. So, um, let's, let's talk about tailoring our goals. So you can kind of dial them in for your fitness level. I think this is one of the right. most challenging things for any runner of any ability level. It gets a little easier as you're a, a more seasoned veteran of the 26.2 mile tour uh, of whatever city. But I think figuring out what exactly your time-based goal or your overall kind of like, how do you put a pin on exactly what it is you want to go out and achieve um, so how do you, how do we, what steps do you recommend we take to, to set realistic and achievable, uh, marathon goals based on obviously like current fitness level, not the like yeah. dream of one day, the dream, one exactly. day I'll run the Boston <laughs> marathon. Yeah. Yeah. I think like as a, as a coach, like if I, if I have a, a new athlete that I'm not as familiar with, what I'll start doing is going through training logs as well, seeing like what, what they have been doing, talk to them a lot about previous race experiences. And yeah, basically really just that is number one, uh, apart from, you know, trying to figure out the fitness level, trying to figure out what's attainable. And I, I do suggest, and I just want to throw this in there as a, as, as coach Kate, um, is that as a, as a beginner, Marathoner, I, I really, 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 really suggest that you just do your first marathon to have a good time and to finish. Um, cause I do have, you know, some first uh, time marathoners out there saying, you know, I want to break this time and I want to break this time. And, you know, maybe if all, if you're an experienced runner in general and all your signs point to these times and you've done a ton of half marathons and they've been super consistent, well, you might have, you know, you might have something in mind that might be a little easier, but for a true beginner, I think it's important to, to kind of think like, okay, this first one is my benchmark. I just want to get there. I just want to finish. And then we have that benchmark for future goals and for future time time-based marathons. And of course, if you're experienced, well, you're looking at your, your PR and you're looking at your previous marathons and your, what you've been able to train for over these past months. So it's all really based around, around that fitness level. But I also think that you really have to take into consideration some important things like 
how much time am I going to have available? Am I going to be able for this cycle? Am I going to be able to train four days a week, five days a week, six days a week? What's my mileage going to look like? Um, you know, what is work and family and all of these commitments that you have? And are you going to be able, you know, to, to, to get all in? And I think that that's an important part of deciding what your goal is going to be. And I think you need to be easier on yourself if you're not going to have a lot of time and be realistic and say, this is what I always tell my athletes, please realistically tell me how much you think that you can really commit to training during the week. Cause it's not just running, right? I mean, well, at least I'm one of those coaches who's a stickler for strength training. So I've got to have that in there. I want to keep runners injury free. So I'm like a big stickler for it. So I'm like, you got to give me a little bit of time for that. You know, got to make sure you can sleep most of the time. I know, Michael, you've probably got some, <laughs> I know you burn the candle at both ends. I know you do. Yeah. It's a, uh, it's the struggle is real. Caitlin, uh, I don't yeah. want to talk about how many hours of sleep I had last night. Let's just say, Oh my goodness. The under over was six and a half. Uh, but yeah, no, yeah. Uh, totally. Absolutely. And especially yeah. as you age as well. Like I, uh, we can yeah. do a little, we can do a little like 40 something corner here, but like, you know, things change. Oh right. And you, you yeah. actually need in some respects more time because you need to spend more yeah. time and more focused strength training more time sleeping, uh, more, more time warming up, more time warming I don't know about up, you. more time cooling Ugh. down. Um, yep. and also, also more time dialing in, uh, you know, that, uh, that proper approach to fueling to, to eating because yeah. metabolism is slowing and it's just, <laughs> it's just you know, the, the, the old saying of the, when the furnace burns hot enough, it'll burn anything. Well, the furnace can't burn <laughs> hot enough anymore, unfortunately for me, at least. So you know, it's cooling off, friends. It, it, it is. It is indeed. It's cooling off. Oh. You know, just I, I was so I was so jealous when I saw uh, we were watching the sprint docu series, and I saw like the sprinters' plates of food, and it was like French fries, potatoes, and like bread. And I'm like, no, okay, that's not realistic in my life. Right? I don't care how again. many. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Not happening. Yeah, they're spending a lot of time in the gym, spend a, time, a lot of time yep. lifting, a lot of time doing yep. very, very hard sessions. So, and that's just you know, yeah. But you have to be realistic to kind of bring it back. You have to be realistic about your time, right? And that's a tough thing to totally. do, especially when you've got ambitious goals, right? Um, you got a family, yep. maybe, maybe you have children. Mm -hmm. It's hard. It's hard to train for the marathon when you got kids. Take it from me. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> especially young children, right. Uh, you've got a relationship, you've got a career, uh, and often this big personal goal of the marathon can kind of, if you're not careful and you're not, uh, can kind of supersede a lot of this stuff. Cause it's really exciting. It's new. It's very, uh, affirmational. It's like people, are, people love to talk about it. They love to, people will give you a big pat on the back for, for doing it. Um, it's, it's really, it's really ego boosting as well. You're getting fitter. You're telling yourself what you're doing is healthy. You have to be realistic about your time, right? So I would say you've got to factor all of that in for sure. Um, yep, absolutely. Now, and also I would say to this time-based goals or big, sexy uh, achievements like qualifying for the Boston Marathon, you have to put into context. Like if you're new to running, and maybe you're relatively young, you're relatively fit coming in. Maybe you've got an athletic background uh, and maybe the training is coming pretty easily. You've maybe been running for a couple of years and you're like, I'm going to jump up to the marathon. And then you're like, I'm going to qualify for Boston. If the fitness test isn't pointing to that, you have to keep in mind that, and this may have changed, but a few years ago, I remember reading a stat that like the average person takes like nine attempts to qualify for the Boston marathon. Now you may wow. not be average, you may be talented to some degree, but you don't know your mm -hmm. talent level yet. So like slow your roll, embrace the process, and maybe you're going to qualify mm -hmm. for Boston first shot out of the cannon. Maybe you're not. Have a backup plan, have a longer term goal setting roadmap yep. in place and have and accept the fact that maybe you won't qualify for Boston even after a decade. So and and that's okay because it's hard. It's hard qualifying for the the times are super hard. I mean, it's it's, it's the Boston it's extremely Marathon. Different. Yeah, it's the Boston Marathon. That's yep. right. You live. You you grew up 
at the foot of the mouth of madness in the Newton Hills. You've watched those people going into it about to fail, right? You've watched the the beginnings of entering the pain cave, right? And right on the right at the firehouse, right at the beginning of Heartbreak Hill every year is where I watch the marathon yeah. from. It's about two miles from the house where I grew up at. So I love the Boston Marathon, live the Boston Marathon. And it is hard. But you know what? Just keep working, keep chipping away and just remember, like Michael said, it's a process and it might take some time, but it's a process and we can get there. Yeah. Don't and don't <laughs> fall for the sub trap that I referred to earlier. Don't fall yes, for this the sub trap, sub four, sub three thirty, sub two fifty, sub whatever. Um, I will, I will use a personal anecdote, which is twenty twenty two, Chicago Marathon. Uh, I had not really run a marathon like pandemic. Kind of, you know, they it, it took the marathons away from us, right, for a while, and. Mm. I didn't know where I was at. I ran a marathon in the spring. Uh, I It was like a just get it done marathon. It was a, a tough mm-hmm. second half. Um, I had to really swallow my pride and adjust my goals and set a goal that like, I think just a few years prior, I wouldn't have been very proud of, but I was like, okay, I'm, I have to, I have to be realistic about my expectations. So that was a good humbling experience in the spring of 2022. Mm-hmm. And then the fall of 2022, I got a lot fitter. I kind of Stella got his groove back. Like I just started to kind of feel it a little (laughs) bit and put the mileage in and the pieces were coming together. And I realized that that spring season was part of a process towards the Mm -hmm. fall and uh, middle and long-term planning. Right. And uh, I started to try to figure out what my a goal was going to be. And I did not fall for the sub trap in Chicago. I <laughs> Good for you. The numbers were really strongly pointing towards 242 as my number. And it's so tempting to just be like, two minutes, sub 240. Let's go. You know, like. It's so much time. <laughs> let's put that down. Yeah, exactly. But it's like, you know, the ego is like, oh, yeah. Like, yep. Put a three there instead of a four. It's going to feel a lot better. Yep. But I didn't um fall victim to my own the the devil on my shoulder whispering like come on come on doyle like let's just go let's just go up to 40 let's just go Uh, for it it. you know set yourself up in the first half and see what happens you know yeah (laughs) Uh, and i was really happy i didn't i ran 241 something i slight i very slightly negatively spit split but in the second half which i personally feel is like a testament to kind of like nailing it. And that's the thing I'm most proud of is when I like even split or very, very slightly negatively split a marathon from first half to second half. Cause that means you knew mm-hmm. yourself and you knew where you're at and then you executed and everything went well that day as well. So, you know, you're fortunate. That's that another it, great goal. Yeah, That's a great goal for the marathon. I want a negative split. Yeah. That's a dream. And not like a crazy 10 minute negative split because then you're like, <laughs> yeah. what was I doing in the first half? But like, <laughs> right, right, right. It's like right. a one minute negative split, 45 seconds, yeah. just like a couple of like, just you're in command in the second half and you're not bleeding nice. out slowly. <laughs> and so I didn't fall for the sub trap and I ran really well and I was really proud of that one. Right. And I think nice. that that is, should be a kind of an overarching goal for everyone is like, just be, to be really proud of what you've done. Right. Um, it's right. a big factor in the marathon. It's a big reason why we do it. Um, so, um, last thing here, proven strategies to, to help you keep motivated, uh, and committed through, through the training journey. Uh, hmm. yeah. How would, how would, what would you recommend in that regard? Um, okay. Let's see. Um, I, I mean, I know that there are a lot of people out there who really, maybe really like running alone, but I think being part of a running club or having a running partner or someone that you can share something, maybe your running partner doesn't run at exactly your same speed, which is okay. Cause you got, you know, easy runs and you have warm ups and you have cool downs and you have, you know, a track and can spend a lot of time, um, with people. But I think maybe, uh, a, a running club, other people can motivate you. You talk about running, you enjoy running together. Um, you have a bad day and then, you know, someone else has a bad day and you talk about it. Talk, talk about something <laughs> else wallow. other than running maybe, but that's impossible. <laughs> Well, that's impossible. You know, just, just a sidebar. I remember I ran this, um, this race called the coastal challenge here in Costa Rica. And it's a six day stage race, like 250 kilometers. It's amazing. You have to do it. Yeah, it was amazing. And I remember 
afterward thinking about we all just like what is it misery company makes misery what is that saying uh misery uh loves company loves company misery but, makes something about bedfellows yeah, something like and that listeners right now are just like they're like, yelling like it's yeah this, they're yelling it guys idiots. it's this yeah, yes we know what you're talking um about. but it was hilarious because we would just, there were like 150 of us in the race and we would just like finish every day at the campsite, like eating legs up. And for the rest of the afternoon, basically not complain, but kind of complain about just how tough every day was, how much we suffered, what things we had. Yeah. Wasn't that ill like this? And yeah, it's just so hot. And this was so hard and this, and I was like, this is great. Misery loves company. Like we're just, you know, so I think, um, that kind of moral support, whether you know, you're having a bad day together, you're having a great day together, or one's pushing the other one, having those people. And I know Michael uh, runs with, with a running club for some workouts yeah. and has some running partners. And you find that help really helpful, right? Super helpful. I mean, l- yeah. really life-changing, actually. Like I, That would be one of my key recommendations for anyone listening to this, especially if you're newer to running or you've been, uh, you've been a lone wolf the whole time. And maybe that's yeah. part of your maybe that's part of your character, part of your aptitude, your personality. Maybe you like doing things solo. And a lot of people who are drawn to distance running like that alone time. I'm definitely one of them as well. Like I like my me time. I like going out on my own. I especially like the kind of Tuesday, Wednesday evening run by myself where I generally run Tuesday a little bit longer when I'm starting to get fitter, not long run, but like longer, like I'll do 18, 19, 20, 21 K, um, on my own on a Tuesday night. And I just get in my own head and kind of think about stuff and kind of, I start working on the goals, that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. But yeah, joining a club, a group, uh, and just getting together with an, an, an informal group of people that are like-minded, uh, and that in some cases, one of the special things about distance running is like, it's meet people from all walks of life. We've talked about this in past pods, yep. you know, where you're, yeah. you develop deep friendships with people that you may have not otherwise met. And it also, it's an, an, an incredible opportunity to kind of like learn more about the different people that are out there in the world, develop a lot more empathy about other people that live in other socioeconomic uh, um, circumstances than you do perhaps and uh, to develop really close friends and, and hopefully not talk too much about running because <laughs> put a few runners in a room together. It's like the only day it's like a New Yorker cartoon of some kind where it's just like, all you're going to want to talk about is running. Right. So yeah, that happens, but it's really cool because you can set goals together. You can keep each other in check and honest uh, about your goal setting. Um, you talk about whether or not you, that person thinks they're realistic for you. Uh, you get that pot, mm-hmm. you get that feedback from them. And then you can also like, I travel with my, my running pals. Like we're going to, yeah. I'm going to do Chicago. I do too. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go to Chicago and there's like six or eight of us that I, that I know that I run with sometimes or often the, the one guy I run with, you know, a few times a week, we're definitely going to be traveling yeah. together and hopefully pacing out much of the marathon together. Hopefully the whole thing. Uh, Oh, that would be, that's the dream. Yeah. That's another really nice goal to have, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So there we have it. Uh, anything else? Uh, any other, any other recommendations? Um, I would say, I think I mentioned it earlier on, but I would say, you know, if your motivation's a bit down, I think celebrating the small victories is super important. So, you know, I know that I get really frustrated or in this past marathon, um, process. I got really frustrated on a day where I wasn't hitting my paces in the long runs. Like I, cause I mixed in a bunch of marathon pace in the long runs and there were like super winds and it was really hot. And I didn't, I did, I was just mad at myself for not hitting the paces like way too hard on myself. And I think that, you know, you have those bad days, but you also have to celebrate the victories because I wasn't, you know, super happy and celebrating when all through the week I hit my paces. So it's kind of like, you know, you have to celebrate those small goals that pop up in between like, Oh, look, Oh, my cadence today was awesome. I, it is getting faster. Um, or, you know, yeah, my speed was great. I really felt strong today. Uh, so I think that that's also a way that you can stay motivated. Um, and I just wanted to, you know, thinking Michael mentioned obstacles and just something else that, you know, can pop up other than demotivation is, is, you know, maybe an injury or a niggle or something that's bothering you. And I think maybe, you know, we should, 
we should touch on that because I think it's, it's, you know, it happens, it comes up. Yeah. Um, and that's something that can really, really just bring you down. I mean, what's your, what's your big, what do you, what do you do, Michael, <laughs> in those situations? Yeah. I, I think for me right now at this point in my life, it's very challenging to have a clean sheet when you look at the, the training plan. So one thing I like to do is, I mean, you can do this with a spreadsheet or whatever, if you want to, if you want to just keep it on your phone or keep it on a, a uh, in the cloud. Uh, but I, I, I physically print out or my, my program with like every day, the date, mm-hmm what the expectation is of when I'm supposed to run. Uh, it's usually in minutes and then kind of in brackets, like miles or kilometers roughly. And then obviously if there's like specific work, like a workout or whatever, if it's a long run, what com- what are the components of that workout or that long run as well? So I, I, what I do to keep myself motivated and keep myself honest is I actually write down with a pen next to that day that, run what I actually did. Mm -hmm. And then I, I do the, I grade it. I give a score at a one to one to to 10 of like how I felt, how I felt about it. Mm -hmm. I often write like who I ran with or I ran by myself. Um, and then I sometimes put in a couple of little notes, you know, like, uh, second half strong, really struggled to keep going in the first half, but you know, Mm -hmm. sort of settled down or whatever and put it into context. So that way I can go back and see if there's, you know, if I've, having any more serious issues, I can backtrack and see if maybe where that the origin is of it. I have not had many injury issues in the last Mm -hmm. I'm celebrating, celebrating 11 years injury free. Yeah. That's awesome. That's like my, okay. That's something that I had a spate of injuries sort of early on in the marathoning journey because I was pushing really hard and doing lots of volume and running really hard all the time. And Mm -hmm. I realized like, I really like doing this and I want to be doing this for the rest of my life at one point. So I had yeah. a major injury before Boston in 2013. And, um, I was like, I'm not, I'm not going through it. I'm not doing this like this again. So I changed my approach. Yep. Uh, I would say that if you do start to feel like tightness or like you're getting thrown off for a day, just keep in mind that no one run is going to define your end race. Like right. if you take a day off, it's not going to, it's not the end of the world. It's okay. Right. You know, uh, Absolutely. if you take a, a big chunk of time off, you may have to reassess goals A and B and that's okay. Mm-hmm. You may have to opt not to run the marathon. That's okay too. It, this is a long process, you know? So that would be, that would be my recommendations. I mean, I would recommend definitely like write down what you do. I write down what I do. And in fact, at one point I started mm-hmm. writing my goals down, like at the bottom of the piece of paper, mm-hmm. like, and then I would like scratch them out, change them. Like, eh, that's too fast. <laughs> Let's just tamp this down a little bit. Um, yeah. So I, I, I like that. I'm sure there's some, I'm sure there's some, some, some science behind writing this stuff down that, uh, we could point to, uh, but it, it really has always worked for me. When I don't write things down, things get chaotic. They get disorganized. Mm-hmm. I and you will forget. Corners. Like you, th- yeah. yeah. And 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 you do think, oh yeah, I'll remember this day because it was really great or it was really bad. And you won't. I always ask. I beg. I beg my athletes to write uh, the comments and training peaks about how they felt because say I can look at all the data. I can read all of your data. I can compare the data. But if I don't know how you felt it's going to be really hard for me to interpret that data. So I feel like it's almost more important sometimes than the data itself for me to know how someone felt running and to keep track of that. Because I think that way also you can, you know, prevent plateaus, you can prevent injuries, you can make and craft the training plan uh, as, as specific as it needs to be to reach those goals. So I think that that's what you said, Michael, about like, writing down how you felt and what happened during those workouts and in those runs is like gold yeah. uh, information for the, for the future. So yeah, I recommend that everyone uh, does that. I, I have mixed feelings about Strava as I've mentioned on previous podcasts and, but I, Strava can be really useful in that regard. It can be um, a great training log. I think, I mean, in many respects, that's sort of where mm-hmm. its origin story is. Right. And you could use that. You can make your Strava account entirely private. Um, you can yep. not exist to the outside world on Strava and just log your run right. and, and then evaluate it. Write down in the comments, like how you felt about it, 
where you ran, mm -hmm. um, what the experience was like. Uh, I find often there's a, a, a kind of an arc to my runs, like easy runs. I often are tired, uh, unmotivated, kind of like in the middle of the slog of marathon training. Like, spoiler <laughs> alert, this is not always going to be enjoyable. Um, right. It's part of the process. You got to embrace the suck. And, you know, you just write down like first, I ran 10 miles, first four miles. I was dragging my feet, sweating profusely. Heart rate was too high, running super slowly, not really proud of the the pace I was running. But then I started to kind of recover and lock in and it wasn't, I'm not overtraining. I'm good. It was just, I was not mm -hmm. motivated and I was tired because it's the end of a long day, you know? Um, mm -hmm. You put that into context. Whereas if you get like four or five days of that in a row, it's like, maybe you're overtraining. Maybe you need to take a Something off. is happening. Yeah. Oh, spoiler alert. My newsletter for tomorrow yeah. is going to have information about overtraining in it. So Sweet. if you guys are listening to this podcast and you are not subscribed to the newsletter, super important because I'm going to talk about overtraining actually tomorrow. So when this podcast comes out and the newsletter comes out, you can kind of get into that if you think or worried that you may have some overtraining symptoms. Subscribe to our newsletter. It goes out <laughs> five days a week. Caitlin yep. and Jesse edit it and uh, it's great, packed with good content every single day, including what you just teased there, um, including <laughs> links to this pod. So, yep. yeah. Okay. So I, I think we get it all. We good. Yeah. I think, I think it's pretty, it's pretty complete. I think everyone's going to have a really good idea of how to start thinking up and cooking up these goals. So, you know, on your next easy run, as Michael said, it's just solitary, easy run. Start, you know, considering these things because if you're already training for the fall marathon, you should already start having these goals in place so you're motivated and you know what you're working towards and your objective. So I think that that's just our probably our best piece of advice is to get thinking about it and be realistic and just have a lot of fun in the process. My goal for this podcast was that we were going to nail this. That was the A goal, and I didn't have a B and a C goal. And we. To hell oh, with our advice. I nailed it. There we go. We did We did it, Caitlin. We did it. We did it. We did it. Awesome. All right. So as Caitlin said before, she's she's done my work for me. Subscribe to our newsletter. If you haven't already, 150 whatever thousand people, runners agree, they subscribe to it as well. So join join the team. Join the join join the movement. And uh that's right. If you haven't already, and if you're a hundred and however many, uh, uh, one hour and 17 minutes into this pod with us, and you've come along on this journey, subscribe to the pod, give it a five-star rating, write a little review, um, and uh, let us know. Let it, <laughs> dangerous in saying this is like a, reading YouTube comments can be brutal sometimes. Uh, give us a review. <laughs> Oh, no. Hopefully, hopefully you enjoyed this and got something hopefully out of it. Hopefully, it's a positive one. Yeah, yeah. Give us a review. <laughs> Tell us what you think. Honest feedback. We're 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 looking for it. And um, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Our our compatriot Alex Sear, the master of uh, of the of the master of the YouTube short. He's taken yep. some time away. He's gone back to the homeland. He's on Prince Edward Island in Canada enjoying a summer reprieve, doing some deep in training, hitting some weddings. Uh, there you go. <laughs> yeah, he's got so many weddings. Uh, yeah. He's going through that wedding phase of life. Remember that yeah, phase, Caitlin? the age, yeah. I remember. Yeah. It's a long time ago. You probably got like tons of weird bridesmaid dresses in the closet. And, uh, That's right. Yeah, yeah, I do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, all right. We did it. Uh, we'll, we'll see you. We'll see you next week.